Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Snevlin coming to you again from With One Accord Ministries with a, with a short uh, video teaching on what I think is a significant issue within the body of believers. And that's what I like to call wrongly dividing the word of truth. Now, we're all familiar with the passage, I hope, in 2 Timothy 2. It's verse 15, and we read, Study to show thyself approved unto Elohim, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we know, like a lot of passages in the Bible, that's not as, as immediately clear. You know, you'll hear different interpretations of what that means. Uh, dispensationalists think it means you, know, you divide up into different dispensations throughout the history of the world. Uh, I don't happen to agree with that. But the, the point is, there's many different ways to look at it. And, you know, but the funny thing about this is, is there's some people that indulge what I call spiritual vivisection. Now, vivisection, when you, when you cut up a living thing, usually an animal, of course, to examine it, it's, it's illegal because it's so cruel. But some people do that to the Bible, to the scriptural verses, because remember, the Bible is living you know, Hebrews. And so the thing is, sometimes what happens is people actually take an individual verse of scripture and whack it in two. And they will neglect to mention either the first or the last pass of the pa part of the verse. And there is a reason for this. They have an agenda. And I'm going to share with you three or four places where, where there's, these are commonly preached Bible verses where something has been censored, something has been wrongly divided away from it. So, most have heard this particular passage, where there is no vision, the people perish. Okay, that's Proverbs 29, 18. And how many sermons? I mean, I even heard that when I was in Amway, for heaven's sake. You've got to have a vision, you know, for your business, whatever. Well, they never read the last half of the verse, because there's another clause within the verse. It, the whole verse is where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the Torah, the law, happy is he. Gee, I wonder why they didn't say that. Why they don't pr preach that. I mean, you know, it's the rest of the verse. Well, it's because, you know, 99% of believers within the body don't think you have to keep the law to be happy. All you have to do is pray and ask the Almighty to give you a new Cadillac or a new home or a mansion or whatever you want to do. And it's like he's this cosmic bellhop up in the sky and boing, there it is. But it doesn't work like that. If you want the blessings of Yahweh, you need to keep his commandments. And this is the problem with this. We don't ever hear the second half of this verse. He that keepeth the Torah, happy is he. Amen. Now, Amen. here's some more spiritual vivisection. It says in Hosea 4, 6, and this is a very well-known passage. Again, we hear it a lot. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I used to preach that all the time when I was speaking about cults and the occult. The fact that, that people, if they don't know about cults, they can be drawn into them like the Mormons who can be so deceptive or other false religious systems. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's great, but they never say the last half of the verse, and honestly, I didn't used to do this either. But it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, colon, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law, again, the Torah, of thy Elohim, I will also forget thy children. Now, that's something that people should, should hear, don't you think? That should be preached from the pulpits, not just the first clause. Because thou hast forgotten the Torah of thy Elohim, I will also forget thy children. Now, who doesn't want the almighty creator of the universe to remember their children? Well, you know, we have forgotten his Torah. I mean, 99% of Christians are out there, you know, they go to church on Sunday, which is not the right day. And after church, they go out and they eat ham and 
you know, pork and shellfish and all these things that are forbidden in the Bible. They violate the Sabbath. They do all of these things that the Bible tells them not to do. And then they wonder why their lives are a mess, why their children are in trouble, why the divorce rate, in the, and actually right now the divorce rate among Christians is worse than it is among non-Christians. This should not be. And it's because, as Paul says, the mystery of iniquity already doth work. And what's iniquity? It's lawlessness. So, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy Elohim, I will also forget thy children. And even the idea of what is knowledge? Well, first and foremost, knowledge is knowledge of the scriptures. Most people act like the whole three-fourths of the Bible that constitute the Tanakh, what, what Christians call the Old Testament, is not even relevant anymore. And nothing could be further from the truth. It's the foundation for what is taught in the Gospels and beyond. And, you know, what happens if you build a house without a foundation? Yahushua warned us that, you know, great would be the ruin of that house if it's built on sand instead of on rock. And what is rock? Rock is the scriptures. So, then we have one more right in the um, Ten Commandments. Everybody's familiar with this. We've all heard this preached. Thou shalt not take the name of Yahuwah thy Elohim in vain. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, first they don't say Yahuwah and they don't say Elohim. Here's the thing. The problem with this is, is they don't read the rest of the verse. For Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, what does it mean to take his name in vain? You ask nine out of ten believers, they're going to say it means you shouldn't curse. You shouldn't cuss. You shouldn't take, say, GD, you know, things like that. Uh, or, or, or use the name of Jesus and, or, or even Yahushua in a profane way. And all of that is, is good. I mean, it, the, that, there's nothing wrong with that, except Yahweh is not nearly as concerned with that as he is with the other two meanings of that phrase. Uh, the word in vain in Hebrew is shav, and it can mean to make desolate, to make it evil, making it useless, making it false, or making it into idolatry. That's right. Now, here's the problem. 99 out of 100 Christians never say his name. They call him the Lord, or they call him God, or they call him, you know, a lot of Christians love to get into these these names of, of Jidashti. You know, they'll say, oh, El Shaddai, or they'll say, they won't, they'll say Jehovah, which isn't even right because, of course, there was no letter J in Hebrew, and there still isn't a letter J in Hebrew. Uh, Jehovah Nisi or Jehovah Yira, you know, um, on and on and on. And they think that's so great, but they don't realize those aren't even his names. Those are his titles. And Elohim, you know, which in English Bibles is usually rendered God, that's, that's a title. That's not his name. His name is Yahuwah. And if you never say it, and as the, the rabbis do, they forbid you to say it. That is a deep sin. That is taking his name in vain in the fullest possible sense of the word. And I understand that originally talking about the rabbis, they did that because they thought that they were trying to prevent it from being taken in vain to being used indiscriminately. But that's that's not a good reason to just totally, like right now, if you ask 99 out of 100 Christians or 99 out of 100 Jews, what is the Father's name? They don't know. The, the Jews will say Hashem or Adonai. And that's not right. His name is Yahuwah. Now, here's the other thing. It can also, to take his name in vain, means to, you see, if we follow him, if we follow Yahushua, we are taking his name upon ourselves. And then, if we go out and we sin, and we act like the devil when we're bearing his name, when people know, oh, that guy's a Christian, or that guy's supposed to be following the Bible, or whatever you, however you want to characterize it, and he's out there, and he's, he's, you know, cheating on his taxes, or he's, you know, all these different preachers you hear about that are committing adultery, 
or are being led away for financial malfeasance or tax fraud or things like that. This is also taking his name in vain. Every bit as much as, as cursing in the sense that most people think of it. Because the funny thing is, if you say, you know, gee, damn something, you know, first of all, that isn't even a word. I mean, the word God is not his name. If you were to say Yahuwah, you know, something, that would be much more serious. But nobody says that. Absolutely nobody says it. Because if people, the people who know his name, tremble at his name and they will never take it in vain in any senses of these words and yeah it's not that we're not we're, we're certain none of us perfect we all make mistakes but hopefully we stay out of sin that will bring his name to reproach which is what we see all the time with prominent preachers they're always ending up getting into sin or trouble and it makes it makes the gospel look bad. It makes, you know, the body of Messiah look bad. And it brings reproach to his name. That is taking his name in vain. Now, notice one other thing about this passage. It says, Thou shalt not take the name of Yahuwah the Elohim in vain, for Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, understand something. What does that mean? Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless. What's another way of saying that? Well, the word there is nakah, and it means to make clear, to forgive, or to acquit, or to hold innocent. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm not saying that it's, it's you know, the only way you could take this, but let's think about this for a moment. If it says that Yahweh will not clear, will not absolve, will not make guiltless or forgive someone who taketh his name in vain that's kind of a frightening thing because it shows how seriously he takes his name and how upset he is when 99 out of 100 Christians never even call upon it you know it, it, the scriptures say whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahuwah shall be saved who calls upon his name very very few and I'm not, no, I'm not saying that if you don't use that magic name, and it's not a magic name, it's the holiest name in the universe. Oh, man. But the, the, then you're not saved. I'm not saying that. Don't misunderstand me. Because he knows your heart. He knows where you're coming from. But still, once you've heard this, there's no turning back. You need to call upon his name when you pray, when you worship, when you adore. Don't call him the Lord, for goodness sake. Don't call him God. I mean, there's nothing terribly wrong with that, but it's not his name. His name is Yahuwah. His name is not God. God is a title at best. And if you really want to use that word, use the Hebrew word. Use Elohim. Yahuwah Eloheinu. You know, Yahuwah our Elohim. So think about this. He's saying, I will not hold him guiltless who takes my name in vain. I will not forgive him who takes his name in vain. That sounds almost like the unpardonable sin that Yahushua was talking about in the Gospels. And remember, when he walked the earth, he said, I came here to proclaim the name of the Father. That was part of his mission because nobody in those days knew it. I mean, the only person that supposedly knew how to say the name was the high priest. And that's how they wanted it. That's how the rabbis and the Pharisees wanted it. They didn't want anybody to know the name. And that, that is very grievous to Father, as you can see. Now, I want to make one more point. Um, the other day, I was on uh, Facebook, and I read this, this. Someone was talking about this passage in Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Yahushua says, and I know I've talked about this before, but I just want to repeat something. Think not. Yahushua said, And I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, that's the Torah, uh, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, verse 19, therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so 
shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do, not just teach them, but do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, there was a fellow on this particular thread who was saying, oh, well, you need to, you've got to understand the context. You've got to understand what the Greek is. You've got to go to the original Greek and all this stuff. He said, because this doesn't really mean that. Now, friends, this is in plain English. You know, that's number one. But beyond that, you know, Yahushua did not speak Greek here. He was speaking Hebrew. You know, because he was talking to an audience of Israelites. He was not talking to a bunch of Greek philosophers. Yahweh forbid. He was talking to Greeks. Uh, pardon me, to Jews. And the thing is, he spoke in Hebrew because any time any Israelite in those days talked about holy things, talked about the scriptures, talked about the Torah, you know, or when they worshiped, they spoke in Hebrew. They might have used Aramaic in their daily discourse, but they spoke Hebrew. Because Hebrew is Lashon Kadosh, the holy tongue. It's a tongue that came down from us from heaven. And so therefore, you know, he would not have spoken this in Greek. So it doesn't matter what it says in Greek. The other thing is, there are no original autographs. There is, he said, he said, the original Greek. Well, we don't have the original Greek. It's lost in time to us. That's why he gave us the King James scriptures, the authorized version. So he would have it in clear, perfect English where anybody can understand this. You know, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You know, and he says, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So I would tell you, friends, you know, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. If the, if heaven is still here, earth is still here, all things have not been fulfilled because obviously we, we are still, all of us, laboring under the curse of Adam. You know, women are still bearing children with travail and, and sorrow and so on. The law is still here. The Torah is still here. We need to honor it because that's how we show how much we love Yahushua. Brethren, thank you again for listening. Uh, we pray that if this has been a blessing to you, you would please share this scripture about wrongly dividing the word of truth. We pray that you would please subscribe to our channel and please, you know, if pray for us. And if you feel so led, help support us financially. Thank you very much and shalom.